Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the show, the Facebook Live show that and podcast that has been going on for over five years. Facebook Live has been just since July 1st, when the radio station on iHeart that I broadcast out of decided to go oldies music. Kind of a strange thing, but that's what they decided to do. And because of it, I got to think of a new way that I can bring my show to you every week and also get, have you see on video the interactions of the people that I've been interviewing for years now. So today I have a dear friend, somebody that I rely on greatly for just so much wisdom and guidance. She is a true wise woman in the world today. My friend Deb Lewis, Colonel, retired um, U.S. Army, 34 years Deb was in the military and the armed forces. She was in the Pentagon on 9-11 in 2006. She Manage a, I think it was what a two billion dollar construction project in Iraq during like the worst of the incursion stuff and everything that was going on. First female graduating class of West Point. I mean, that's insane. We want to talk about stress. Deb has seen it, handled it, moved past it, and now her job, her her passion, her purpose in life is to help women and men to understand how stress plays out in their lives and how they can turn stress into a positive advantage before it can curtail them, sideline them. So Deb, thank you so much for being on the show today and talking about this new work you're doing with mentally tough women. I love that new uh, company that you started, that new branding. Thank you, Laura. I am thrilled to be with you today. This is my inaugural. I've never been on a Facebook Live, so (laughs) this is a learning experience to me. I've watched plenty of them, but uh, you, my dear, have been the pioneer in in heading out there and changing up the format. I think this is a lot more interactive, so thank you for inviting me to be here today. Well, it's so great to have you on always. I mean, you've been on the show multiple times, um, and I, I just love the, the message that you've always talked about and always shared. This whole idea that not only stress is what we make of it, but really more that stress happens. Um, it's, it's always there, but our response to it and how we allow it to impact our bodies and to be expressed is something that is easily controllable. I mean, that's that's the part that blows me away. When I talk to you, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. I, I didn't have to go through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about the easy part, but it can be taught. And yeah. we, can, we can change our reaction. There are plenty of quotes about that. There's plenty of scientific knowledge. And they estimate maybe up to 90% of the, and I'm gonna distinguish, unhealthy stress from regular stress, because I think stress in general gets a bad rap. It's essential for our lives. But the unhealthy stress is the stuff we're talking about. And they think that 80 to 90 percent is is imagined. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so talk some more about that. What do you mean by it's imagined? Well, it's kind of like the age old thing that well, what if this happens to you? And what if that happens to you? And, and if I do this, and then, and then he doesn't like me, because look what his expression was. And, and I think I'm not going to talk to him again, because he yelled at me. I mean, you start getting into this loop of, of crazy thoughts. And, and much of it, I think is based in our childhood. It's not so much that you know exactly where it started, kind of these dysfunctional beliefs and habits that we have. But I think it has to do with with understanding that once you're aware, it starts heading in that what I call that negative direction. (laughs) When you're aware that it's heading in that way, that's not healthy, then you can actually do so much to control it. I, I think the the one example that really stands out to me was when I was in the first class with women at West Point. And unlike a lot of the audience, is many people may be runners. I was not a runner. I was an athlete, 
but I wasn't a runner. And if I did run, it would be a 50 yard dash. And what I didn't realize, I prepared a lot. I think I got up to a mile and a half, but the very first run was two miles. Wow. And once I heard that, you, know, you start going in that panic mode. This is the one where it hasn't happened to me yet. So that's the imagination part. But I'm imagining how horrible that's going to be. And of course, your heart rate goes up. You start going shallow breathing. You, you start, your eyes start darting and you're not focused on what you have to do. So your body is going in survival mode. Right. And, and I think that when we started off, I also had intense pressure to succeed because there was huge, it was a huge social movement. People don't remember this. We've had constant waves of social change. This is not something unusual. Social change, social injustice, women have faced it for, for the world ever since Eve. <laughs> You know, and and always being lesser and not thought of and can you know confused. You can go back, but the idea is is that you have to focus on what it is you want. What is it you want? And in that moment, I wanted to succeed because I knew that all eyes were on us. And the standard, unfortunately, it's the reality. It's higher. You're going to have eyes. You're different, and I love to be different. I love to be underestimated. But I was different. And on athletic side, that was to push me to my limits. So you, anything can push us to the edge. But for me, running <laughs> became that one thing that really could push my buttons. And so I, we started the run. Remember, you're in formation. You're with people. I have people over a foot taller than me. I call that a, an advantage. <laughs> their stride because you have to do it in formation. You have to do it, you know, step at a time. You have to stay in formation. You have to not step on the person in front of you. And I had someone who was pretty good size and they were in my space. <laughs> you got your little space anyway. They were in my space. So I was competing with all kinds of things, crazy, crazy. And within the first half mile, it got worse. It, it got worse because we only had three women in the platoon that we were running in. And one of them fell out. You know, um, that means they dropped out of the run. So my whole brain's already thinking, this is crazy hard. This <laughs> is crazy hard. You know, what are you thinking? You know, right? And then I watch her and, and then I'm, it's proof. You know, you get this proof, right? It's proof. It's crazy hard. Look, she just dropped out. And, and before I completely lost it, I looked over to the other person. This is Camille Barassa. She was a gazelle. She could beat, I know, over half the men in our platoon in running. She was that good. I didn't really know that at the time. All I could see was this woman wasn't breaking a sweat. She didn't look like anything was phasing her. And I knew I didn't want to be like the one that just fell out. I want to be like that one. And so what I did is I, I, unbelievably, I learned to control my breathing. I controlled my heart rate and my panic attack. And I solely focused on, I'm going to be like Camille. I want to, you know, we all have examples. I'm right. going to be like Camille, one step in front of the other. Stop worrying about all the other things that could possibly happen, but take one step after another and just do my best. And then I had a horrible affirmation that I made up, but it worked. You know, sometimes you come up with <laughs> well, really it's not horrible. If it worked, it's not horrible. <laughs> well, in my mind to what I do now is like, if you can find anything else, do it. But at that time, you know, your, your, your uh, tool bag was pretty limited. My tool bag was pretty limited. I now have, as you can see, we'll talk about later, a lot of tools. But at that moment, I said to myself, you're going to pass out before you fall out. So oh, you, interesting. You difference, right? You're going to pass out. That meant I had chosen, I will go out cold, which some women did. It didn't work for them. Okay. Some people just pass out. Men too will pass out cold or, you know, fall to the wayside instead of falling out of a run. Because I was determined, I am not gonna give them the satisfaction of me falling out of this run. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm like, I can do this. You know, I've done so many things in my life. I was Knowing you, I can totally picture this, so that's okay. 
<laughs> well, I was a swimmer. I mean, that is always your personal best. It's kind of like cross right. country, but it's always your personal best. Yes, you're on a team and you may do relays, but it's your personal best. And I was a horseback rider where I had a crazy horse. I had a horse that would leap like two feet higher than the jump we were jumping. And it was a pretty considerable jump. I need a parachute on landing, right? So I knew how to be in, in crazy hard circumstances, but not this one. But I, I figured it out. And you know what? I made every single run that year. It, and we were in combat boots at times. We were carrying weapons in our arms. So, you know, I don't have much, you know, compared to the guys, I didn't have right. much of a body strength. And um, we, running in combat boots that had no support. I mean, really, today we've got running shoes and even the combat boots have have much better support. And I have high arches, so I learned that was a problem. And when I wore combat boots, the back of my heels would start to bleed because of oh, the chafing, right? And I have one of my roommates, she had a broken toe and it never stopped her. Kathy Ann Wildy, now Kathy Ann Funk, she never had it stop. Her, you know, she ran the second summer, which was even harder than the first summer because we added all the hills. Right. All right. So. I want to I want to break that down a little bit. OK. Hey. Brandon Webb has been on my show before, back when it was on broadcast. Navy SEAL sniper, revamped SEAL sniper training school, brought mindfulness into it. And he described like you that moment except his was in SEAL training when they're like literally in your face trying to break you down. And he was like the small guy. Nobody expected him to make it. And they're making him do all these things. And the guy goes, you're going to ring the bell, which means get out. Oh, yeah. One moment he realizes that the only one he's fighting with is himself. And in that moment, he knew that he would survive and thrive through the rest of SEAL training school and sniper school and everything and everything he had to go through. Is that something that is just really a military thing? Because I seem to know so many military people who are able to get these deep levels of focus in these really trying circumstances, the ones who excel, right? We all know that not every military person excels. We hear the stories. Yes. Um, PTSD is a real thing, even in people at the level like, like you, Deb. It, it's there, it's real. But what is it inside of you that enables you to make that shift, that moment where the stress isn't you fall out. Right, right. I, I think that I think that it's not necessarily only military, but I think that the military pushes us intentionally. We knew, I knew for anyone going to West Point, that was a hard experience. And a You're woman. You're going to be pushed. Well, let's set that aside first. Okay. For anybody going to West Point before, since 1802, <laughs> we entered in 1976, since 1802, guys had gone there, they'd been hazed unmercifully, they had been, you know, physically, I think at times, they certainly mentally, intellectually, uh, running, doing all the things, always pushing the limit. Now, in life, we will have traumatic events. And before COVID, they thought that um, the estimates were 70% had had a traumatic event in their life. And, and so you either figure out how to deal with it. People will say coping, but what if you can thrive? And I think that's what you're getting with Brendan is that I didn't want to just survive. I wanted to thrive. And I think that that's a real different goal because you're going to say, hey, it's just going to get harder from here. I recognize life's tough. I want to be tougher. And I think I made that conscious decision to say, whatever they throw at me, I'm going to find something to hook into that's going to inspire me, aspire me, and also get me to focus on what it is that I want. And, and that may have been brought up because of my with my dad being in the military, although we never, he went to West Point, but we never visited West Point. He went to Vietnam. But I think that you want to succeed. You want to be there, not just, I don't think I ever looked at it for me, but serving others. You have to be at your best and you, and you want to overcome whatever's happening 
I don't think I consciously thought of it as a storm passing, but it really is like a storm. When a storm, no matter how horrible the storm is, it will pass. And so you just have to hang in there sometimes. You just have to do whatever that takes to hang in during the period of time. And then, but always constantly, I think children know it best. Children under the worst circumstances will find the least thing like a little round rock or, you know, something they'll find to draw their attention to get happy again. Right. Right. And I think we lose that when we get intellectualized. And so the idea is, what is that that we draw from? It's maybe partly a survival instinct, but I think it gets back to the joy of life that you, that as a baby, when a baby smiles, you know how precious that is. Mm. It makes everybody smile. That's the, st- they can even have a mechanical baby smile and people smile. I was reading that one time. And so, you know, the idea is that a smile has the power to change your day, right? And so you figure out, you have to figure out what's that thing that's going to help you get through it. And I think in the military, because you're going to have to be facing constantly changing stress. This is the latest kind of insight I've been getting in the past week. It's like, oh, I choose to do crazy hard things, starting with yeah, do. Work. I do. And I've never stopped. I mean, I'm getting ready to take over in a year, in, in, in just less than a year, of an organization of VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars. I've been doing the parade, as you know, with thousands of people involved. Now we got COVID. Oh, that's a new stress. There's constantly changing stress. And our skill at being able to handle that stress and be able to, it, to do it can strengthen and improve our relationships, not just with ourselves, which I think is number one, (laughs) strength with ourselves, but it can improve the relationships that we have, whether it's at work or at home. And I think that when we, when we realize it, the ability to handle that is really something we have to work at. It's not something that I'll tell you, it doesn't come naturally. It didn't come naturally to me. Um, I, I've been working on it every single day always. And there's constant things that there's constant stress that's going to be thrown on you and layered right on all these other things. And if you hadn't resolved what's down here below that, then it's just going to be like the straw that broke the camel's back. And you've seen people do that. The straw that we do it. (laughs) Yes. Now we all can do it. But how quickly do we come back is the skill that I work on, because we're all going to be tested for that. Me too. When my computer ate like weeks and weeks of stuff. I remember my first instinct was to get on the floor and pound the floor going, no, 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 no. And then and then I decided to go for, you know, my three wheel bicycle that I ride. I, I passed my husband, Doug, and I was coming down the hill. I said, I'm going for a bike ride. And I got on my bike. I said, this is not helpful. This is, you got to get an awareness. <laughs> Pounding the floor is not going to bring my stuff back. And then you start figuring out what you can say in your head. Well, that just meant it wasn't worth it yet. I'm going to create something better. I'm going to do something better. I'm going to, I'm going to now take a break. It's okay to take a break. Some people can only take like a 10 second break. If they're in the middle of the COVID crisis doing medical stuff, they can, they they need to do it quickly. They, they've got to just go to a place real quickly and then move to move to something better. So I think that the military certainly keeps, it's like, I have this shield here. This is one of my, my tools that I, that I use as a metaphor. So the shield is very emblematic. Stuff happens in life. It's constantly like arrows. You ever seen those war scenes where the arrows are just flying? They just yes. let it fly. And so <laughs> the stuff is coming at you. If you let it land on you, it can kill you. It can hurt for sure. And so you have to have a shield, something in your mental capacity, something as a thing to do that you're going to be able to shield yourself from it. And so you got to be like Wonder Woman. You know, I got my Wonder Woman gal. And so you want to be able to shield yourself from that because otherwise you're going to be sidelined and maybe never come back. That's the post-traumatic stress. Okay. Let's, let's go through this a little bit because you've, just given us tons of amazing information. <laughs> and 
there, I get so excited about it. I know, I know. I, I love that you're excited about this work because it is really, really powerful work. You know, when you're talking about the shield, I pictured Wonder Woman with her bracelets, you know. And, and well, it, first, it, I have to show you, this is one first that the audience could see. This is the early Wonder Woman, remember? She was frustrated. She wanted to get into the battle. She wanted to know everything all at once. Not so fast. She had to take the time to learn the skills and still didn't understand the true power that she had, you know, early on. Right. She just was a great, like, she chose to do hard things. She wanted to climb that mountain. She wanted to be riding that horse. She wanted to be learning the thing. It's good to want to improve yourself and be better. But it wasn't until much later that she was able to be skillful at it, right? Right. What are some of the first things that my listeners can do if they can't take a bike ride, they're, they're in the middle of whatever, they can't escape, they can't go away, they're in the middle of some high stressor, or they don't even know what the stress is. Let's take it even back a notch. They just know that they are struggling, that their cortisol levels are through the roof, they're hurting, their body's physically a mess, they're not thinking well, they want to hit something or throw something or yell. What are some of the first things that they can begin to do to become aware of the stress and then put their shield up to diffuse it? Got it. That's a great question. And I thought a long and hard about this. It's taken me a lifetime to come up. I created a course, How to Handle Extreme Stress. That's what you're talking about. And extreme stress is one of those things. It's the physicality piece that you have to deal with first, much like the running, okay? And so I have five steps in order to handle extreme stress. Okay. The first thing that you have to do, and I, I've had this too, and I'm smiling now, but I got to tell you, I have been hammered. There were plenty of times in my life that I wanted to give up. I'm in tears. I am, I am just thinking, this person is crushing me. You know, you can just have a person yeah. do it. Or you can just have a health circumstance. You know, why is my body rebelling? Why can't I do this? Especially as, you know, I see when my do dad's 94, his mental capacity is all there, but his body's not doing what he wants. You oh, know, you by the way, shout out to, to, to Ben and Malvine because they're probably going to listen to this, your mom and dad. Yes. yes. But the idea is we have to be able to adapt to changing circumstance. But when we're first aware, the most important thing that we can do is to control our breathing. But yet okay. when you're in that situation, Deb, it's like you can't breathe. Like you can't exactly. catch your breath. You, you have to focus on what you can control. And yes, I understand that. But the idea is sometimes you have to order yourself. When I was getting ready for the five operational briefing in front of admirals and generals, and I had 30 people feeding me information, this was just before 9-11, right before 9-11. I was doing anti-terrorism work, and I, I became the operations briefing at the top military command center. OK, because I kept putting my ear to the door saying, what are you guys talking about? What are you guys <laughs> talking about? And they'd say, well, because I had to implement what they were talking about. And they right. would never share, you know, there was never these notes that came out. It just would be these disparate little guidelines. So I, I want to listen. I became it. But what I didn't realize is that during a huge shift change of personnel, not just the shift change, but actual people on the team changed, 20 out of 30 didn't give me the information I needed to give my presentation. And I realized it one minute before I was walking into that room. And trust me, I was panicking. I was feeling the worst. I was feeling, oh, my God, it just took me over. And I ordered myself to breathe. I ordered myself to breathe because I knew that if I, if I starved my brain of oxygen, I was just going to get much worse. You're starving your brain of oxygen. We do this. A baby knows how to use their full lung capacity, okay? For some reason, we decide we're going to use, oh, 50 percent's good enough, okay? Or, or yeah. less, especially in panic well, under, or stress. On a normal time, they're saying we only use 50 percent normally. 
we breathe shallowing, shallower now, right, from when we were babies. But when we're under a, a tense attack, we can stop breathing when we're under intense pressure. That's right. We go into panic. So until you get your breathing under control, your brain cells are dying. You can only survive three minutes without oxygen. Okay. It has to be the number one thing that you do. And I have one, if there's toxic things happen, I call it the waterfall. It's three seconds in seven seconds out and very deliberately through the nose is we want to breathe in through our nose because what happens when we panic, we start breathing through our mouth. <gasps> and if you've ever done that, your throat starts drying out. Yes. And, and you and you and you start it starts hurting, right? But if you're breathing through your nose, the moisture is actually getting to your throat. This is how we need to talk too. I breathe in through my nose, I talk with my mouth when it when it's going out. But the idea is that waterfall, I dream of it. I live in Hawaii. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for all you rest. I chose to live in Hawaii with my husband. And, and I think of waterfalls cleansing what's toxic inside of me. And so I'm breathing in three seconds. Try it. Let's just do it. One okay, time. Let's do it. Guide let's us through it. it. Okay. For those so on the podcast, um, if you're listening to this in the car, do not close your eyes. <laughs> don't close your eyes. I'm not saying close your eyes. I'm no, saying but some people just do that. So okay. don't. Yeah. Please, good warning. <laughs> Breathe in through your nose and then out through your mouth. Second, seven seconds. In through your nose, shorter. Three seconds is good. Seven seconds out. Three seconds in. Seven seconds out. So like the waterfall, your your air's coming through your nose. It's washing all that toxic goo out as you breathe. And if you put your hand up to your mouth, it's hot. <laughs> it's hot when you're breathing out of your mouth. That's that hot mess you want to get rid of. Okay. And so that is number one. Number two. Okay. Before you go on to number two, because I'm sure this is popping up for a couple of people. We're recording this during COVID. Yes. And when you're doing breathing like that, you, your exhale tends to be a little more forceful than perhaps your normal breathing. And people may be worried about that. So that may bring another stress into yeah. the whole idea of taking a breath with a mask on, with a mask off. What you what would you say to somebody who is concerned about taking those breaths during COVID? I think you're absolutely right that people panic. And, and I can tell you, I felt that way with some of those masks that I put on. Some of those masks do not allow you to breathe. <laughs> okay. You, you, I've, I've given, we, we, in our church, we've been having to do it virtually. And they're like long readings that I'll be reading with a mask on. We do not take our mask off. A lot of people do, but we do not. So I'm having to do the breathing. breathing. If you've got a mask on, make sure that mask allows you to breathe. Okay, because there are plenty being manufactured that are not good. And then it's the control piece. It's still trying to deliberately control that pace that you're doing. Because okay. if you're going to just go, and so in the number time, you're trying, I know that sounds funny, but in the number time, you want to breathe in slowly. Three seconds is actually long for us. So, it, you know, you do what's best for you. There are other times, people have different times, but I find three seconds I can focus. One, two, I can go, one, two, three. And then I can go, after that, I can go seven seconds with my mouth. And then, yes, COVID can, because of your breathing, you can harm people. So that's why they say social distancing. <laughs> it's important okay. to do social distancing, six feet, if you're singing, six feet is not enough. They've already proven that. And then if you take your mask off, we know that it can be more. We have to not just protect ourselves. We have to protect all those who we interact with. And I think that if you have something important enough in your mind of why you're doing it, what you're focusing on, you can master it. You can master it. And you have to tell yourself, like I said, sometimes you got to order yourself. I had someone after a person had yelled at me, you, that's the event we met at where the woman, <laughs> where the woman was screaming and, and, and humiliating people. 
And I decided to take her on. <laughs> I said that's up thinking, Colonel Deb. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do the no bit 500 people. Nobody else is doing this, but I'm thinking this is wrong, but I couldn't take it on angry. I had to take it on happy. So I said, please call on me. Please call on me. <laughs> you know, and she did. And then I stood up there and all my five feet five. And I said, you know, you're a bit abrasive, but I can take it. I've been the combat. And then, <laughs> And then at the end of it, I realized not so fast. <laughs> she <laughs> harpooned me just as much as she harpooned the others. So when I sat down, the reason I say that is I felt like a failure. All of us can feel that way at times. And I swear, my breathing just, I lost my breathing. And I'm like, <gasps> <gasps> and the woman happened to sitting next to me, bless her heart, was an EMT specialist. And she kept telling me, breathe with your diaphragm, breathe with your diaphragm. And I'm like, oh, I'm trying. No, not your chest, your <laughs> diaphragm. <laughs> and, you know, your logic here in panic attack is not thinking. But I'm telling you, when you control your breathing, you will control what you're thinking and the choices that you make. Okay. I noticed when we did the couple of rounds that we did, I felt my shoulders go down. I felt the chest just relax a little bit more. It didn't feel as tense. So that's really great. So the first step is breathing. Yes. But I will and tell you, here's an added benefit. I've got lots of little tools along with it. You just brought up one that made me think of in that moment is that actually you're so stressed. If you tense your arms and your shoulders intentionally and then relax, that can bring the same effect, especially like when you're going to bed. I do that a lot when I'm going to bed because my mind's racing with all these things I want to do, <laughs> all these hard things I want to do every day. And, you know, I didn't get enough done and I added 10 more to my plate. And then your mind starts going, how am I ever going to fix this? But I will do it. This was Joel and Michelle Levy taught me this. They are master mindfulness people. But you, but if you tense up different parts of your body, I start with my shoulder area. I start with my midsection area. And, I, and then I do my legs uh, and feet. Is that by just tensing for a fraction, you know, a couple seconds and then relaxing, it can have the same effect with your shoulders as well. Okay. So if the breathing doesn't work, that's another technique that people can that's, use on that first that's, step. That's, so then what's next? The bottled water, the well, not bottled water. I would say healthy water, wherever healthy you can water. get it. Healthy water. Water is one of those things. Okay, remember I said three days for breathing. It's you. You can last. What is it? Two weeks, three weeks with it. With if you're on water, but you can't last without water. Water is like three days. <laughs> you have to have water. You have to have water. In, oh, that was food. That was the food one. But the water's like three days. So the water, when you're under stress. Your body is taking on all those, all those hormones and bad things are building up in your system. They discovered that when you cry and you're under stress, that's why people cry, is that's one way to get some of the toxins out. They can, they can test for that in your tears. I, th I was fascinated with that because in the military, it was thought, you know, crying is a sign of weakness. Today, I'm saying it's a sign of strength. So that day we met when I cried five times until Wendy Lipton Dib Dibner gave me permission said just make yourself cry <laughs> give <laughs> yourself permission yeah, give right. yourself permission and it all stopped right when you don't give yourself permission and you realize that that's actually a wonderful stress relief when it's all built up those toxins build up in your system but water is what does that and you have to have like your eyes are almost 99 percent water other parts of your body maybe 70 and higher percent water I have a plant that I, I use in my video to show that if I didn't water it properly, you, you, the stems all flopped over the ends of the, the side of the, the flower pot. And I thought to myself, I bet that's what's happening in my body. And when someone did massage on my neck, they asked me if I knew what beef jerky was like. And I said, <laughs> yes. And they said, well, your tendons are like beef jerky. They're horribly dehydrated. I can't tell you how many times. So drinking water, but it's not that simple, I found. So I have a, a simple habit that I do is it's whenever you get rid of water, you need to drink a bottle of water. <laughs> so every time you go to the bathroom, you need to drink a bottle of water right then and there because you remember and tie it 
hey, I eliminated, I need to refill that. It'll be another hour or so if I have to do anything with that. But the fact is, is your body is just like my plant. If you're not constantly watering it, it's going to dehydrate. And I'm guessing that people who have a lot of illness may not, it's not the only thing that can help. But definitely, if you aren't drinking enough water, there can be too much. But if you're not drinking enough, parts of your body are shutting down and, and signaling, hey, this is emergency, drink some water. Because they say, the people who are experts in it, if you're thirsty, that's already too late. You shouldn't be thirsty. You should be drinking so you're never really thirsty. You know, I'm thinking through that because I always feel like I am in a constant state of dehydration. Even my blood work shows that I'm dehydrated, but I feel like I drink a lot of beverage, you know, water, and that's basically my beverage of choice. But it never feels like it really gets to where it needs to go. And uh, a friend of mine said, Laura, add cucumber to your water or put some stalks of celery in your water so that the mineral salts sort of leach into the water. And I have whole house water filter because Florida water is absolutely disgusting out of the tap. <laughs> See, our water, tastes, our water tastes amazingly good. It's, it's very fresh. If you get it, our system is from the fresh water in Hawaii and it rains all the time in Hilo. So, right, you've got you that know. whole volcanic filtration. Thing yes, going on. Yes, yes, but you are absolutely right. People have to figure out, like my husband puts tablets in his water because otherwise he would never drink water. You have to make it palatable for you. But the bottom line is coffee doesn't count. <laughs> People think drinking any liquid counts. Soda doesn't count. That does all kinds of bad things for your system. It has to be enough water. And, and I don't know if you drink, I drink a bottle of water at a time, not the big bottle, but you know, about a 16.9. Yeah, 16.9 ounce one. And I have to like I have to drink like a third of it, and then I can throw another third, another third. I may not be able to drink it. I can get to like a half or three quarters. I'm getting pretty skilled at that because I'm rushing. <laughs> I'm going to go do something else, right? But just by doing it, you can feel your system feeling better, and and you don't want to drink more than that, and you don't and you don't need to have to be drinking like many gallons because that's unhealthy too because you'll lose all the electrolytes, like you said. I mean, you can right. you can do that. But I'm telling you, we are in a state of chronic dehydration. And we're always doing it. The excuse is, well, I'll have to go to the bathroom. Okay. You'd rather destroy your body than have to go to the bathroom. Some people will make that choice. But I think that a huge amount of ailments um, can be attributed to the lack of water, lack of adequate water. So everybody's different of what okay. they need. Okay. So we've got breathing and we've got water to help. And then what's next? The next one for extreme stress, I'm glad you asked. This is the one where pretend, okay, so so we've just done two things, right? The first step, pretend you're carrying a huge load. Everybody's carrying a huge load these days. Think of a backpack that is with brimming. We had to carry 35 pounds in combat, okay? And that was, that was without carrying anything else. That was just our gear to protect us, right? So for me, I felt like I was always getting shorter every day. Right. <laughs> And my head with the helmet, that was never, I had padding on here, you know, and then strapped it down because it was it, rubbing against your head was just miserable. And then it would get up like some people in California are now experiencing, it would be 120 degrees. So think of, think of the load as a big pack. So the first thing to get rid of it is you have to breathe. You cannot step without breathing. Next thing is you should always think of yourself carrying a bottle of water. Now what I'm going to tell you is to take that load off for a moment. Pull that backpack off of you and all those and pretend it's all your emotions that are in that backpack. Okay. Pretend okay. that all your emotions are in that backpack. John Gray in uh, Women Are From Mars, Men Are From Venus gave me a, a help, reverse helpful insight. Or right. men are men are from all, no men are women are from Mars. <laughs> Men are from Venus. Men are, well, well, in the depth oh, world, women are from Wonder Venus. Women are from Venus. Men are from yeah. Mars. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Okay. Okay. So, okay. I'm too excited. All right. So, the un unpacking the backpack, he said that if you leave all your emotions together, it's like this huge snowball that she just keeps getting loud, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger as it's rolling down the hill. 
Now imagine if I have all these emotions, we have all these human wonderful emotions, you know, through the whole spectrum, there's reasons we have even the bad ones. I'm never saying some people say, well, you're saying just don't be upset or angry. No, those are important indicators in our life. But you have all these emotions in your backpack that you're lugging around with you. Now, if you leave them that way, it, the load's going to get heavier and heavier. Heck, even just holding a bottle of water for an hour, your arm gets really tired, right. even though that's not very much. So imagine carrying that all the time. That can stress your body. What he said is you need to divide up all those emotions and decide what's causing that. I'm angry because of this. I'm disappointed because of this. I love doing this. I'm happiest when I'm doing that. You have to unpack all those emotions. And then you decide which ones you're putting back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a key piece to it. Yes, yes. Because the happy ones are actually like those helium balloons. They're lightening your load, right? right. Those negative emotions, imagine those being like lead. <laughs> you know, they're dragging you down. And if you can carry it, if you want, you've been doing it a long time, right? But if you unpack them from time to time, you don't have to do it all the time. But definitely, if you're feeling the negative energy, you must unpack them and decide what are the ones and really understand them. Because until you understand them, you can never move forward with them. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. But you know me, I have a few questions around it. <laughs> I would, I would expect then that when it comes to stress yes a lot of emotions come up yeah. and they're not always emotions we can just necessarily just say I'm not going to pick them up again I'm not going to put them in my backpack you know you know how much you helped me when my mom was living with me and we were going through everything health-wise that she was going through or when I was going through my divorce, but like more related to my mom. You know, there was, there was some worry, but there was like loss. There was um, love, which was a stressful emotion for me because I loved my mom so much. Of course. But it was a stressful emotion. It was a stressful emotion because the tiny bit of the loss, it only took a tiny bit. Some of you, I think you like cilantro. I do not. <laughs> if cilantro is in the mix, it taints everything I'm doing. Right? Okay. So you can be hypersensitive to certain emotions and certain triggers in our lives. And okay, so, so it's not the love that it's, was really the, the triggering piece. It was yeah. this loss that the came loss. because of it. So it's... It's unpacking them to You say, didn't say, separate those. Okay, got it. Okay? And in, well, until you can separate those, then it will constantly be a trigger and taint that. Okay? And it's not that you want to forget that. I told you to unpack it. I didn't tell you to, to burn it. Right. <laughs> right? But the difference in the stress, if you've ever watched, I love Dwayne Johnson's The, um, the Titans, right? Oh, the Titan Games? People, the women, you know, when we went to West Point, they didn't think we could carry any kind of load or do anything, really. There were a few Olympians, like Joan Benoit, right? She could do the, the marathons and stuff during our time. But there were very few out there that can do it. But Dwayne has shown just how powerful men and women can be. And he's got them doing the same tasks, but against each other, right? We can carry so much and get trained to carry so much. If you want to carry that around, you have to be stronger, you have to be stronger. It's not that I want you to forget any of that, but you have to realize that what about all that joy? Do you think you could spend more time and mementos and reminders to think about the things that made you smile and laugh and just be funny, right? And, and buoy you up rather than the moment that you know that when you lost her that she's not coming back, right? Because... Okay. It's not, it's a fact that that happened, but it's how you bring life and keep bringing that into your backpack, right? Because right. that loss became like a hundred pound load for you. Yeah. And until you choose to say, hey, wait a minute, I had my lifetime with her. Many people lose their mothers at seven, eight, 
12, childhood, you know, you, you in, in, if we do it from a relative perspective, it's hugely painful. If we do it from a um, absolute perspective, which is worldwide view, holistic universal view, you see that, oh my gosh, on a comparative scale, and then maybe you help others get through it who lost them earlier because you have that empathy, right? right? And you have these memories. I mean, I treasure my mom's 89. She's lived longer than than her family um, did. And she's still in amazing health. My dad, 94, his brain, he's he's got he's better awesome. memory. He's got better memory than me. We all know we will die someday. And and we have people dying from COVID at, at incredibly short years, right? Right. We, it, it's 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 crazy to think about. We're never guaranteed life. Life is tough. I want to be tougher. I know you're incredibly tough. You have already, you do not give yourself credit for the wonderful <laughs> attitude, the smiling face that you have. I will repeat this as I do with many people. The people I meet are the happiest and have the most love in their lives are not the ones who had an easy life. They're the ones that have gone through the muck, mud, just overcome tremendous challenges in their life and figured out what was most important. You figured out those things that keep you important allow you to function at this phenomenally high level. To you, it's still not good enough. I know, I know, <laughs> because you're going to have better days than other days. I know. But on an on a absolute basis, you're a miracle walking. And I know this, I've known you for years. You were that day when you were that beacon of light when I was having one of my worst days. Now, combat, I had a really bad day, but I had never felt so more, so embarrassed because I cried five times that day. Okay. Even though, yeah, so go ahead. This just popped into my mind, so I really, really want to share this. Okay. You said, you know, you had all these really horrible moments in the military, but there was something about that day and it, I don't know if you've created this link with your men. You had your armor on in battle, in literal battle, right? You geared yeah. up. So in you, in whatever way, you geared up to help yourself prepare for it. In that conference room that day, when she went on the attack, you didn't have any armor on. You didn't have your mentally tough woman shield. No, I didn't. You're right. That's and true. And the work you're doing, I ju this all just... I'm, I'm, oh God, I'm so excited about this. All, you're giving let's us run, armor. Let's run with that. Okay, so if I had had my armor, here's what I would have done. Okay. First, is I would have had my shield up as she was attacking other people. And I would have somehow, you know, my energy to those people, my love going to those people would have been, you know, protecting them too, right? Prayer. Right. We know prayer and this positive thinking can help other people. The other thing that I really wish I had People, people think bad things about swords, okay? But the thing is, is that she was doing personal attacks against them, which bother me the most, because I see the wounds. You can, you can see the wounds. And I've been in battle where people have died who worked for me. You know, lovely, beautiful, talented people have died for me in, in combat, working for my organization. It's protecting me. My, my uh, driver got killed after he dropped me off to go do some other tasks and then was coming back to pick me up. You know, we do have real things. Those are real threats. But the ones that, that people do from their mouth, words cut, words wound, words kill, right? They, they right. can hurt people, but they can also lift up. But, for the, but what I wish I had was metaphorically that as she was attacking me and I stood up and said what she did, is you need a sword to deflect those things, much like karate. You know, right. you, you, when it's coming at you, stop. St I stood there like I always did. I stood there like this with no armor on, like you said. That's right. true. No armor on. And it just, whoo, it, it wounded me almost mortally, right? Yeah. And, and what I didn't have is as it was coming at me, I could have flung it. I didn't have the wristbands that Wonder Woman has. <laughs> but it was like a, a sure bullet coming toward me. And we have to figure out what that is for each of us. And the other thing is, I wasn't skilled, and other people are far more skilled in this, 
But sometimes you need a sword not to run other people through because they irritate you or they hurt other people, but you need a sword in order to have them back off and to pin them so that they stop doing whatever they're doing. Okay, and that's the effective question. You can you can ask someone a question that can stop them in their tracks. You can ask a question that says, you know, I'm, I I think I asked her the question which wasn't as effective, but it, but it was what I said. I said, I'm having a hard time understanding if you're trying to help people live their dreams, why you are humiliating them. Right. That's the question that I had. I couldn't, I couldn't get that disconnect. I think that set her off to launch the final attack. I think she had her, you know, those, I forget what they're called, the ones where you put the big heavy weights on and they, you, you crank it down and you launch it. I think oh, that's, yeah. when she, that's when she launched it and landed right on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I wasn't skillful. The other thing, the other thing that I think I did have, because I didn't get angry with her, I didn't yell at her is the helmet. The helmet signifies like Athena. Athena was the goddess of war. Over 2000 years ago, we talk about Athena and she's still well known today, not just because she was the goddess of war. She only did it out of wisdom. She was also the goddess of wisdom. And so our helmet signifies protecting the best of us. Like when you're breathing, like when you're drinking plenty of water, your brain has to stay at its best. If your body fails you, make sure your brain is at its best. But a lot of times people forget that. And that's when they start yelling at other people. And I'm just stressed. And they give an excuse to be miserable to other people. It turns out that woman was going through a divorce. Now that can explain it. It doesn't justify why she did right, what it, it doesn't it justify it. But it does explain a little bit what was going on. And I think I'm empath I'm empathetic in a way that I sense that toxicity that was just churning in her. And rather than what many of us do is internalize and be hard on ourselves, she was dishing it out <laughs> to the other people because that's another way to deal with it. Okay. Right? And the way now that you know to if you're feeling attacked like that, whether it's a verbal attack from a person, it's a situation that you're feeling crushed by. Once you've, I, once you've taken a breath to calm yourself, you've had some water to help your body deal with everything, which also is a way of just stopping for a moment. You've identified the the emotions that are causing and and you get to the point where you can do this in a few seconds kind of thing yes, yes. and then you're asking some clarifying stuff but I, I think a lot of people struggle with that part deb which is i need to respond somehow this is the fourth step the fourth okay. step the fourth step is focus on what you want Okay. Focus. And what does that mean? I want to choke this person, but that will not be who I am at my best. That will only feel good in the moment, you know, and at that point, my best option was just to be quiet. <laughs> you know? As frustrating as that was, I did my best. I sit back down. What do I want to focus on? I want to focus on what I want. And what do I want? First of all, you have to survive. You have to focus sometimes on your survival. You have to bring yourself back because you do not want to. It says if 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 uh, you can't think of something nice to say, stop talking. <laughs> but I sometimes could not, I could not do that. Yeah, sometimes you just need to say something. I I would beg to say. You, you do need it, but say it in your head. Do not speak it out loud. Okay. When you give voice to it, when you give voice to it, then that toxic energy, like COVID, you've just shared with the world. Okay. And do you really, you know, just like these times, you need to, what do you want to, if you truly care about the other people in your life, you will treasure them, love them, and never dump on them. You will never, they can already see if you're stressed because that's not normal, right? But if you start saying, well, hurry up, or you're too stupid, or, you know, you know, 
You're that lazy. doesn't mean You're that lazy. you should that you should continue to keep yourself in that situation that continues oh. to cause it. But what if it's I, I know folks that are stuck at home with all their kids in small New York City apartments yes. Yes. and the stress is just building up and building and up. Unbearable because they have no release. So how about this, thinking about it? Because this is the way that I think about it. Engineers think about it this way too, which your dad was an engineer too. So the engineering mind will say, okay, pretend this is like one of the toughest games you've ever played. You know, gamers, if there's a trap door somewhere, there's, <laughs> there's, there's another door to hide behind. There's something I can do short of doing what my urge is, is to just do mayhem, right? Right. I love that commercial with the mayhem. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's like you always have a choice. And sometimes it's just say, like, in family, that's a whole nother level of stress. We need we could talk a long time okay, about Okay, work. That. I've got but, a client that, right now yeah. dealing with what I consider an expectation issue with their boss. Every single time the boss sends them a text, they can feel their whole body so tense up and at some point they need to say something in a way that will open a conversation <clears throat> or diffuse okay they're constantly feeling let me let me um let me give you an example because okay. and we're starting know, tight on time yeah, so okay um let me just we'll say, have to do a part two but go ahead okay. there's a there's a there's a young lady i i, I meet people a lot like that where usually it's they think it's an antagonist there's a person that's usually what pushes it over the edge trust me i had bosses that would not be someone i'd follow to the anywhere <laughs> but i learned a lot from them but this young lady she actually quit her job the person did something that upset her so much she quit her job okay wow. and and in in training them well i know you wrote in in decisive women walk away to win so there oh, are nice. times that maybe that is appropriate However, in this particular circumstance, as things were building, she was never able to share or question, it's all about the questions, question things that were happening. For example, when he asked her to do like fetch the coffee, and you would get this, she was hired to be a technology person in the office, had been doing a monumental job of doing not just the technology, the marketing, right. I mean, brilliant young woman we have so many brilliant people and yet he was he came to the office he hadn't been there for months he comes in now full-time and then says go fetch the coffee she was the only woman in the office okay right you, we want to like choke somebody like that say <laughs> what what part did you not get that this brilliant woman is doing so much for you well the truth is he didn't know because she had never, she didn't say, this isn't an elegant way to, to respond, but she said, hmm, what if she had said something, you know, I can do that for you. I'm just a little curious. I was hired to do this, 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 and this is what I've been doing for you. And if I start doing that job, which I can physically do, then I'm not going to be able to do these other things. Which one would you like it to be? You know, you, you give them an option because most of the time people who are doing annoying habits and things and, and crushing your expectations because really that's the imagined piece, our expectations and then what people do. Is that person doing exactly what they normally do? Sometimes I'd have to almost get a hammer. Sometimes I'd have to wave the sword. Okay, do you really want to say that? I remember I told someone who said he didn't want me in a job because I would be the second primary woman leader and he didn't want two women on his staff. Um, I basically <laughs> said, I basically said, do you want me to, um, to hit you here or punch you out outside? You've got 20 men. What's the big okay. deal if you have two women? Oh, <laughs> well, no, we had 800 men. Okay. Yeah, and the two, he didn't want him in the leader. But I'm saying people do in the office a lot of crazy stuff. But the only way is to kindly and lovingly come up with something like we do with the question that you wish someone had asked you to help you get right, to help you see what's happening without judging. We love to judge. The thing is, is you, you, bad, good can't, won't, shouldn't, didn't, you know, how terrible people cheer us on. You should get mad. 
<laughs> I would say the only time I would say I have the no word. I said, I think you want to say, well, maybe I have a maybe button. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. You know, maybe you can do that. But the idea is, is there something <laughs> better that you can do? Is there a better response? And the other one is, yes, it's hurting that person. Every time, What's a, what about those expectations is causing you, again, unpacking the emotions, what about it is bothering you? And then say, what is it that you want to do? Okay, let's come up with some questions you can ask, and maybe you don't want to do it in person. Maybe you're going to do it on an email, but because it's positive, anybody can read it and say, that's a good question. It's a okay. reasonable question to ask. That's that's great. I, I love that. That last piece, I think, really brings it all home on how you can take action to shift whatever is the continual cause of it and what we can do for ourselves immediately to shift things down. Now, even just at- pausing, even just pausing is helpful. And then we'll get, I'll just very quickly do the last one, if that's okay, because I know we're short, short on time, we're done. Real short on time, because I, I like to try to keep this to an hour for everybody listening, and you and I can do an extra one. <laughs> I just want to give them the last one so they don't have to think about it. Okay. The last fifth step, which you can go to the course, and you can go in more detail and remind yourself, but the fifth one is pretend that you're a vehicle driving around doing all these errands, Right. If you don't fill up your tank, what's going to happen on your trip? Okay? You run, run out of gas. gas. <laughs> so what do you need to do? I'm one of those people because we can have hurricanes and other things. I never want it to go lower than in Florida too, obviously. I never want the tank to go lower than half full. And I really like it at three quarters. So <laughs> I'm constantly going to fill up my tank. But the idea is what do you do to fill up your tank? And I can do things in 10 seconds. I can listen to a song that's maybe three minutes or meditation. I can dance. I can, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things I do to lift me out of the seriousness of the moment because just pausing might be enough before you, like you said, sometimes you feel you have to say something. If it's going to come out of your mouth or the thought is forming that's toxic, negative, kind of reactionary, judgmental, what a failure that person is, what an idiot, you know, well, how lazy, blah, blah, blah. If you're saying those things in your head, you are trashing up your system and everything around you. You must figure out a way to refill your tank so you can always live with joy. I love that. I love that. You have courses that you've done. Um, which I'm a huge fan of. I've done them. How? And you said you had an offer for my listeners right now. Yes, well, yes. If they go to my website, mentallytoughwomen.com, and they do the forward slash Deb, D-E-B, that's my name. If you do that, you'll get an email with the links to both those courses. It's not just the extreme one, but the one that is a lifetime, both of them are lifetime and coming, but I had to deal with the urgency. The extreme one is the urgent one. Do it and then make sure you maintain it, like working out every day or doing okay. something uh, every day to replenish that tank. And then the second one are the basics that if you understand these, you will know that that you are at your best. At, and, and yes, we go to negativity sometimes, but you'll be at your best around those you care about and love, and you'll be building for the future instead of lighting, like my dad, the no button is my dad. He'll ignite a fuse in my mom and she'll get upset. He's working on it. But a large percentage of your audience, when someone says a fact, they'll say, no, that's not true. It's like lighting a fuse. Okay, you want to use that negative word, light it. So go to their mentallytoughwomen.com forward slash Deb, and I'll send you an email that will allow you access to these courses and hopefully be part of the team. I want to help and empower a million women and their families to be able to handle these stresses. This is not a time to say, woe is me. It's a time to get stronger. Make it happen today. I love that. I love that, Deb. And I, I just love having you on the show again, talking about this great work that you're doing. Mentallytoughwomen.com slash Deb. Get your free courses, everybody. Um, I know Deb went through, you know, the different five steps, but in the courses, there's so much more and they're free. Okay. They are free. So I have over 2000 people in a hundred countries taking them right now. So yeah. I'm praying, you know, I want to get it out there. We have to help each other. 
I can't do it alone. I have you. You helped me in that moment. My husband helps me on a daily time. I mean, we need people in our lives that also understand it. So do it with a significant other friend or, or someone. That's great. And, and so that it will reinforce. So they know that when you start to get ready to blow your lid, <laughs> they have some tools and things, tools and things that they can be able to help you. So you'll stay at your best. All right. Doing this work really helps you put on that armor to protect you from the stress that is life today and turn it into a positive experience. So I love that, Deb. Thanks again for being on the show. And everybody, for me, doing these shows helps to expose you to new thoughts, new questions that you can ask yourself, you can ask other people, new perspectives for the way that you're going about your day. If you love the show and you've really learned something from it, please share these videos, share the podcast with your friends and family, rate and review it, reach out to me on social media anywhere. Let me know how it's making a difference for you because that's how I know and that's what keeps me going. That's what takes my stress and throws it away and gives me such bubbling joy inside every moment of every day, knowing that I get to make a difference in your lives by doing these shows. And remember, as always, the right questions can change your life. So what are you asking today? Have a great day, everyone. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today.